Belle Island, Newfoundland is situated just north of St. John's in beautiful Conception Bay. The tiny island probably got its name from the unique rock formation at its western end. With its rugged beauty, Belle Island has become a photographer's delight. The community of Lance Cove makes an ideal photographic subject. Wabana, the hub of Belle Island is a quiet, peaceful community. Vibrant, bright and colorful. A drive or walk in any direction will attest to the fact that the residents continue to take pride in their homes. This town wasn't always as peaceful as it is today. During the 1930s, Wabana was a thriving mining community. An abundance of high-grade iron ore was mined from the damp shafts that traveled far beneath the waters of Conception Bay. In 1935, Bell Island's ore was feeding the steel mills and munitions factories of Nazi Germany. However, when war erupted in 1939, all shipments to Germany ceased. Great Britain now needed iron ore for its war production efforts. To meet these demands, loaded ore ships from Bell Island often joined convoys traveling from North America to England. In 1942, the Battle of the Atlantic was escalating and Germany, unable to obtain ore from Bell Island, gave some of it back. On the evening of September 4, 1942, U-513, under the command of Captain Rolf Rugerberg, entered the shallow waters of Conception Bay in search of prey. The next morning, rising to the surface, two vessels were spotted, anchored off Lance Cove Beach. Two torpedoes fired from the U-513's bow tubes quickly sent the Saginaga to the bottom. Each measuring more than 120 meters, these unprotected vessels were an easy target. Rugerberg, although cramped for sea room in these shallow waters, maneuvered into position and fired two more torpedoes from his stern tubes. His efforts sent the Lord Strathcona plunging beneath the waves. On November 2nd, 1942, Captain Friedrich Wiesmann, commanding U-518, attacked and sank the Rose Castle and the PLM-27. These attacks caused 69 seamen to lose their lives. I believe my father beat it to the beach as fast as we could come down here to the beach. We had a, an old flat there on the beach. The luck should have it. The paddles was in the flat and everything. And we weren't long going out there and brought them in. The walk was right here at that time. People screaming in the water, screaming and screeching. I thought some fellas with life jackets on and more hanging on to piece of plank. Yeah. Some were alive and there was people dead then from the shock, I suppose, we could see there was some dead. But the fellows were holding on to the piece of plank with no life jackets on. They were the ones that we brought in. We started him bringing loads of them, right? Oh, you can't put it in words. I mean, uh, the people from this island in Newfoundland, I mean, they went out of their way more than 100%. During this attack, a torpedo struck the Scotia Pier, causing a great amount of damage and rattling windows all over Bell Island. I mean, they got a terrific shock, especially when the torpedo uh, struck the loading pier. I mean, it smashed windows and houses that were nearby, knocked dishes off the shelves, and I'm told, I was told by a policeman who was on duty that night, uh, that even some residents were, were so frightened that they got up, they dressed their kids, they put on their Sunday clothes, and just sat around the house and waited for the enemy to they come. They thought the Germans were They coming. thought the enemy was going to come and get them. They, they thought this was the end. Bill Flaherty from Newport, Rhode Island, is Ocean Quest's chief researcher. Recently retired from the U.S. Navy, he spent years studying the U-boat attacks in Conception Bay. Through careful research of the U-boat commander's war diaries, he believes that the remains of a torpedo may be found in the area around the sunken Rose Castle. Bill discovered that a torpedo's body often stays intact after the warhead has exploded. 
Bill questions, is there a torpedo in the area? If so, can it be found? In July 2000, under overcast skies, Captain Rick Stanley and the Ocean Quest team prepare to leave the Foxtrap Marina to dive the Rose Castle. Today, a diverse group of people representing the major participants in World War II is traveling on board the Ocean Quest. Bill is from the United States. Joining them is Ingel Vollmer from Germany and Simon Lowe from Great Britain. Rick, his wife Debbie, along with Ken Reed are from Canada. This adventure is Simon's first dive with the team and Bill confirms his dive certificate is current. Simon, you got your certificate with you? Yeah, brought along. Okay, club instructor, all right. Okay, looks good. This should be a... Uh, I've been doing some no deep problem. dives recently. I can show you those on the oh, computer okay. if you want. All right, we'll check that out yeah. too. Okay. okay, sounds good then. Welcome aboard, Simon. Thanks. The trip to the Rose Castle takes less than an hour. Never having been on this wreck, Simon is apprehensive about the experience. Well, you got her, Kenny? Good job, buddy. During the briefing, the team decides that Simon, Ken, and Debbie will explore the Rose Castle while the others search for the torpedo. As I mentioned before, during my research, uh, I found that this torpedo, my best guess, would be located about 100, 150 feet off of the stern here. This is going to be a deep dive. The vessel lies in 50 meters of water. Visibility in the area is expected to be about 15 meters. Hey, put the... Uh, Deco bottle out over the stern here. As the divers prepare to enter the water, an extra air tank is placed over the side. At the depth of today's dive, a decompression stop may be necessary. Debbie, although small in stature, is an excellent diver who loves exploring the wrecks. Having made several previous dives on the Rose Castle, she is very familiar with the ship's layout and will make sure Simon has a safe and enjoyable dive. Ingo has been diving with the Ocean Quest team for years and has made numerous dives. He has returned to Newfoundland specifically for this dive. Ken, a diving enthusiast and a valuable member of the Ocean Quest team, will act as support diver for both groups. During the attack in 1942, the Rose Castle sank in only 90 seconds, and her deck now lies at 30 meters. Upright and intact, the vessel is in amazingly good shape, having been on the bottom for more than 50 years. Once bustling with activity, the ship now lies ghostly silent and covered in an abundance of marine life. Today, the visibility at this depth is excellent. These sunken passages are open and spacious. Navigating them is relatively easy and presents no problem for divers. These wrecks, however, are ominous and foreboding. Extreme caution must always be used when entering them. Safety measures, such as guidelines, should always be used when venturing into the bowels of these vessels. Deep inside are the remains of the radio room. In 
Entering the midship deckhouse and cruise quarters, the remnants of a bathroom are clearly visible. Being totally familiar with the layout of this wreck, Debbie ventures a short distance inside. Simon and Ken, remaining within her sight, continue to explore the area. Dedicated to preserving all wrecks as historical sites, memories and pictures are the only things ever taken by these divers. Having completed their dive, Ken leads Simon and Debbie to the surface. Off the Rose Castle stern, the search for the torpedo begins. Going deeper, the light from above on this overcast day quickly diminishes. The deeper a diver goes, the greater the pressure exerted on the body. For a diver breathing compressed air, the increased pressure causes the body to store nitrogen gas. This gas must be released from the body before a diver can surface safely. Failure to do so can cause a diver to suffer decompression sickness or the bends as it's commonly known. This sickness can cause permanent disability or even death. To avoid decompression, the team will only spend a few minutes at this depth. At 50 meters and about 100 meters from the stern, Ingo is attracted to a faint outline of an object on the bottom. He continues to venture forward. There it is, the elusive torpedo. By a stroke of amazingly good luck, the torpedo has been discovered on the first dive. Bill's research has paid off. Lying mostly intact, the torpedo's warhead is missing. Without the warhead, this relic presents no danger to the divers. Laying on the sea floor for more than 50 years, the remains of the torpedo are in relatively good condition. Rusted and exposed areas afford the divers an opportunity to have a closer look inside. Now lying in ghostly silence, it's difficult to comprehend that this relic of war may have been responsible for the death of more than 28 sailors. After a close examination of this historic artifact, Ingo and the others head to the surface. Finding the torpedo as quickly as they did, a decompression stop will not be required. So I found it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that place, very close. Yeah. Very close to the rudder plate. Very nice. About 100 feet off. Yeah, what do I think? Returning to Newfoundland earlier in the month, Ingo suggested the Ocean Quest team present an artifact to the people of Bell Island. In October 2000, the mayor of Bell Island, council members, along with members of the Provincial Archaeology Office, joined the Ocean Quest team in Lanscove. Today, they plan to recover the ring that locked the warhead to the body of the torpedo. So what we got here is the ring just off of the uh, torpedo. This is the part that's missing from the torpedo is the, uh, the, warhead. the warhead. And that would have been what, like about six feet long? Yeah, I guesstimate that. We have some specs on the, uh, on the torpedo. Uh, it's about six feet. The torpedo uh, total there now is about uh, 16 feet long, I guess. Mm. But the uh, ring is there. We're just going to go down and pick her up and uh, I'll put it on a lift bag and gradually bring it up to the, the surface. When you retrieve the ring, we'll take responsibility for it and uh, wrap it properly, keep it as much as possible in the condition it was found, okay. take it back to the lab okay. and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, start desalinating, getting the, the salt out of it, getting right. it stable. Yeah. Very good. It's good to have somebody who, who is able to, pro to handle it properly.
Under a clear autumn sky, the Ocean Quest arrives at the wreck site. Once in the water, Ingo quickly returns to the torpedo. Laying in the open on the sea floor, the ring is estimated to weigh between 40 and 50 pounds. A lift bag is attached to aid in its recovery. Ingo adds ear from his backup regulator to provide the extra buoyancy needed to raise this historic artifact. Rising slowly, the journey to the surface will take about five minutes. This dive has been quick, therefore a decompression stop will not be necessary. Safely on board the Ocean Quest, the ring is found to be in amazingly good condition. Wow. Although rusted, it is still solid and in relatively good shape, having been on the seafloor for more than 50 years. Sir, look at that. You see it, Rob? Look. All are afforded an opportunity to closely inspect a piece of our area's deadly past. Congratulations are the order of the day for successful completion of this historic mission. Nice and warm down there. Lucky be in small deck. At Lance Cove, near a monument dedicated to the events of September and November 1942, Jim Walsh, the provincial minister for the area, congratulates Ingo and accepts the artifact on behalf of the people of Bell Island. How many people lost their lives because of this? Anybody remember? I believe 28. 28 the, because of this Rose alone. Castle. Yeah. This Rose was Castle. aiming toward the Rose Castle. This okay, year. so 28. And only uh, 30 days from today would be the 58th year. Yeah. A month from today. So, so right. was it mounted this way? I'm just looking at the way the, the screw holes might have mm. been. So it was in that way. Yeah, I believe this is the main body. Coming out. Yeah. yeah. From here. yeah seems and then the warhead would be out here. That's what I'm saying, going that way. So right. it would come this way. At least a year will pass before the ring is placed on display. Time is required to prepare it. Each Remembrance Day, the Ocean Quest team holds a special ceremony on one of the area's wrecks. This year, a cross will be placed on the PLM-27. Where we're going to tie the cross onto is an old machine gun bracket there. The machine gun is missing, but the bracket is still there. And uh, there should be lots there to tie the cross onto. So, uh, so when we get down, we, all we got to do is just pop up the one deck because it's yep, right here. It's right in the center. As soon as you, you just pop up on top of the, uh, the stern deck house yeah. there, and the uh, we'll we can tie her on right there. And uh, of course, everybody get around as we're tying it on. Try not to stir up too much because uh, we'd like for everybody to get a good uh, view of it after it's all said and done. And we'll all get around the cross and we'll do our uh, minute of silence. Today, Rick, Debbie, and Ken are joined by eight local divers for this special event. Once everyone is suited up, the cross is reverently lowered into the water.
Darren Taylor slowly carries his homemade tribute to the fallen to the deck of the once proud ship that now lies nine meters below. This is a solemn occasion, and it's not a time for exploration. Today, the focus is on the activities at the stern. The evidence of human cost and the artifacts of war are strewn about their feet, reminding them that this remains a dangerous place. Once the cross is in position, the group gathers at the stern to reflect in a moment of silent prayer on the tragic events that took place here so many years ago. The wrecks off Bell Island, upright and intact, are in pristine condition, providing a world-class scuba diving experience. The Ocean Quest team will continue to conserve this area in memory of the events that took place here.